Folks, if you can hear me, would you please make yourself comfortable in your comfortable chair and favorite beverage so we can get started? Can you all hear me? I can, dog. Thanks, Liz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session in our Woodland Conference mini series of 2021. My name is Don Cameron. I'm a regional forester of the Department of Lands and Forestry based out of Toro, and it's my pleasure to be your MC for this evening. In the spirit of meaningful reconciliation, we acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people in what is today Nova Scotia. The Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1725 and subsequent treaties remain foundational to the relationship between the Mi'kmaq people and all Canadians. We are all treaty people. An introduction to these conferences. This conference mini-series is a variation of our annual Spring Woodland Conference Series, which we've been organizing for, for many years, actually. Despite the pandemic, we're pleased to be able to, able to continue to offer interesting and educational presentations this year in a new online format. Many of you have been, have been here for other sessions, and we welcome you back. Hopefully, it'll be safe to meet again in person for next year's conference series. In the meantime, we hope you're staying safe and healthy during these very challenging COVID times. A little bit about the WebEx AV setup this evening. You as participants are automatically muted and your video is turned off for the benefit of the presentation. Your names are invisible to each of you, but visible to us, the event organizers. There will be opportunity, plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions. There, there's a Q&A panel on the upper right side of your screen where you can post your questions when it's time. Or if you know them now, you can start. All you have to do is click on the arrow beside the Q&A. I'll read the questions to the presenter and then the presenter will answer the questions verbally. Now, if for some reason we don't get to them all during the time allotted, we will send out answers after to each of you uh, personally to answer your questions. We will have a, a set of polling questions that will appear uh, near the end of the presentation and they will appear near the Q&A session section. Please note that in case you would like to go back and review some part of this event tonight, or if you know of someone interested who's unable to be with us today, this is being recorded and will be posted online for future viewing. The previous webinar sessions that were recorded were um, along various topics, very interesting topics. The link of the, for these sessions is available at NS Woods website. That's NS Woods, N-S-W-O-O-D-S website. Chainsaw draws. At the end of the six part conference mini series, we will have two lucky draws for two steel MS-362 chainsaws purchased from the Tractor Dome in Milford and S.J. McCray and Son in Bedeck. You as participants will receive one ballot in your name for each of the sessions you attend. More information on this later. Today's speaker bio and any other any speaker handouts will be available also through the NS Woods website in the coming days. Now format a little bit about our format this evening. Our presenter will respond to questions after completing his presentation and we hope to go for an hour. So we will be here till 8 p.m. approximately. We're happy to be able to offer this special COVID version of the Woodland Conference series. For those of you who are regulars at our annual conferences, you may recall that we create agendas for each session based on feedback we receive from you, the participants. So that's my first plug for you to provide good feedback for us at the end of today's session. So in terms of the Q&As, We'll try to answer as many of the questions as we are able to in the planned time frame. But if the time becomes limiting, we'll prioritize those questions based on uh, the connection to the topic in today's presentation. It's our intention to provide answers to all the questions posed today. If we run out of time to answer them, we'll provide the questions in the coming days. We'll provide the responses in the coming days to those that ask the questions. Now, our presentation topic today is a popular one and much discussed, including with woodland owners and forestry people because of potential short and long-term effects of climate change. It's not a day goes by now where you don't hear something about the climate crisis. Tonight's presenter, James Steenberg, is a research scientist with the Department of Lands and Forestry based out of Toro. James, we're looking forward to what you have to say regarding climate change and forest carbon. Forest carbon. The mic's yours. Thanks very much, Don, for the introduction. Can you hear me and can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. 
Well, this is great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk. And, you know, of course, I'd like to be there in person. I think uh, one of the last things I, I would have done in terms of presentations before COVID and, and the lockdown was um, present at the, uh, the, the Woodland Conference in Caledonia. So I'm really happy to be here again. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Looks like we've got some great attendance. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, if things go awry digitally, um, uh, Don or one of the others, uh, Liz or Christy will, will jump in. And uh, with that, I'll just I'll just get going. Okay, let's share you. Okay, can um, we all see my screen and the slides there? Yes. Thanks, Don. So, not a very creative uh, title. It's literally uh, pretty much as Don described it: managing woodlands uh, and woodland carbon in a changing climate. But that kind of covers it. And um, and I'm going to touch over on a few things today, mainly around um, uh, the impacts and and magnitude of of climatic change uh, that we might see, and uh, some of the connections and implications for forest carbon and and indeed managing uh, uh, forest carbon on our woodlands across this province. So the agenda for today's talk, things that I'd like to touch on uh, are uh, climate change impacts and adaptation, uh, and then a special little segment on uh, climate change and, and natural disturbance regimes, because our disturbance regimes in this province are becoming more uh, important as we look to implementing ecological forestry. Um, and speaking of implementing uh, ecological forestry and, and the recommendations of the independent review of forest practices, uh, we'll shift over to carbon and then we'll we'll talk about carbon and what, what can be done in terms of woodland management uh, and carbon in, in the through the lens of the triad. Uh, and then we'll just look at some trends in forest carbon uh, in Nova Scotia and how things have been changing recently. And uh, lastly, I'll touch on a, a popular topic I know that people probably want to hear about, and I hope I can give you a little bit of an update on what's happening, but there won't be much, unfortunately, just by the nature that there, there isn't too much happening here locally, but um, we'll open up some, some talk on carbon offsets uh, as well. So first, the climate change. I'm going to um, just, if you see me looking at the side, I just want to keep an eye on the time here for myself. And uh, I'll also, when I forget what I'm going to say, I'll take a sip of my coffee. Uh, it's a very uh, different experience, you know, sitting down and presenting. And I'm used to, if, if you've heard me talk before, I usually pacing up in front and, and drinking my coffee a lot faster than I am now. But we'll just uh, try and make it work and bear with me as I adjust to this new format. So. Uh, let's look at uh, the changing climate itself. Um, we know, and I've mentioned this at, at the past Woodland Conference that I was at, uh, that um, under let's well, three broad sort of lenses of, of um, what the climate change could be, uh, both in terms of no change at all, so really our historical climate, which is almost entirely unlikely because we're already seeing uh, documented changes. Um, and then two of the, the bigger scenarios of change that come from you know this international um, uh, authority uh, that does international assessments of climate change called the IPCC and there's this middle scenario that uh, I've just given them sort of easier to digest names and all these letters and numbers which is you know things are getting a bit worse but sort of in the next few decades in mid-century we, we reduce emissions and turn it around to constrain the severity of change uh, as much as we can and then this uh, you know, the worst case scenario, which unfortunately for us is also the business as usual scenario um, uh, here looking at precipitation change. Um, so it, we're fairly lucky in our, our small little uh, maritime province here is that in that the changes aren't uh, anticipated to be as severe in Nova Scotia compared to other regions globally, uh, that is, so the Arctic or, or drier regions, for example. In fact, we're expecting to not get too much drier, but to actually get more precipitation on an annual basis. But, you know, moving forward here, oh, I uh, switched my clicking power here, there we go. Um, you know, we're constantly developing at the Department of Lands and Forestry um, new data sets to help provide insight into, into climate change. And, and soon we're gonna be working to make these publicly available, of course, because that's the most important point. But um, you know, the, the, the climate change and carbon program um, at the department really only started um, a few years ago, three years ago, almost exactly um, uh, when, when my position was created. So 
thing, things are moving along, but um, we're, we're constantly working with uh, new data that we, we have and new data that we acquire from, for example, the Canadian Forest Service to get new insights onto what climate change means for the woods. So, for example, we know precip, uh, precipitation will, will increase generally in the province, but, you know, it really matters for, for managing a forest when that happens. And, in fact, um, if we look at this map, what this is showing is um, what's called at the top there the precipitation anomaly, which is just the, uh, the you know, $10 word way of saying the change in uh, rainfall uh, in the summer only, the three summer months um, between our historical climate in this province and between our our business as usual scenario in the last few decades of the of the uh, 21st century. Um, so what we see is that in most parts of the province, um, the, this here is millimeters of precipitation in the summer. Uh, in most parts of the province, we're going to have less rain in the summer, which is which is problematic, of course, not just because there could lead to, to drier conditions, droughts and um, uh, impacts on forest growth, slower growth and mortality, and of course, impacts on, on biodiversity. Um, but in a warmer climate, you need more moisture, more precipitation to, to even sustain the same amount of forest uh, growth. Um, this here, uh, these two maps show what's called the climate moisture index. Give this a bit more context as well. So the climate moisture index is essentially uh, the difference between how much rain is happening uh, in a given year and uh, how much water is needed to sustain forest growth. So the potential evapotranspiration. Uh, what, what this means is that, um, uh, you know, a full forest with, with, with closed crown conditions um, needs so much water to be able to, to grow and, and photosynthesize and pull carbon out of the air. And if this number, uh, as it gets, as the number gets lower, there's more, more moisture stress. And if it goes below zero, that means there's not enough moisture to support sort of closed canopy forest conditions. So thankfully, even in the most severe climate change uh, scenario. We're not seeing that in Nova Scotia, but we are seeing uh, specifically it getting a bit more droughty and a bit more stressful for our for our woodlands. Um, temperature, as we know, and this is a slide from actually my last woodlands presentation, we know that it's it's getting warmer and warmer. Uh, that's the easier one uh, really to, to look at here. Um, potentially warmer from from three to six degrees uh, uh, in mean annual temperature, which is a lot because this is an average over the whole year. So I decided what I thought I would do is, is try my hand to take some of these messages around the growing season uh, and moisture and forests and in particular changing temperatures and come up with a, a fancy little uh, infographic to sort of walk through what this might mean uh, for some of our key tree species. So a lot of the research that I do and that is really the staple of uh, much brighter people than myself uh, who are do have been doing research on this for decades um, how we look at the effects of climate change on, on tree species and, and by de facto of forests and ecosystems is um, we, we pull the best information we can about their range, um, so their geographic range. And based on where we know they're growing across North America, uh, we can then profile the climate within that range. And, and we can look at, with the changing climate, where that range might be. So how, how suited might our tree species be to, for example, uh, our business as usual uh, worst case climate change scenario in the year 2100. And th these are the things that drive the forest growth models that feed into things like growth and yield and these kinds of things so that we can hopefully uh, better adapt our woodlands to, to climate change. So one of the key variables uh, that we use um, in, in this modeling um, is an indicator of growing season length uh, and warmth. It's called growing degree days, and you know they're used in, in farming uh, as well. So growing degree day is essentially um, an accumulation of both days, but also how warm it was in those days uh, above five degrees Celsius, which is just you know when when really trees start to grow. So you know as a simple example, I had to write this one down. You know five days at at ten degrees would be twenty five growing degree days, or thirty days of twenty five degrees would be six hundred. So there can be way more growing degree days, obviously, than, than there are days in the year. So across this center uh, bar in the middle of the slide here, this is growing degree days showing a range across uh, North America, where the smaller numbers uh, towards the left of the screen are, are colder, more northerly uh, climates. And the larger numbers, you know, all the way up to 6,600 growing degree days, you know, this would be down in, in Florida, for example. 
And then this little blue uh, bar with triangles and this map of Nova Scotia's growing degree days, really our, our growing season, um, is is where we are on this whole spectrum. And if we take some of our key tree species here, I've got our some of our main hardwoods across the top, as you'll see, and their current distribution in the province. Well, we can we can look at their climatic range and start to get an idea under these climate change scenarios of what things might look like. So red maple you see stretching all the way down to those warmer sunny uh, parts in, in Florida, all the way up to, um, uh, you know, we're pretty much near its northern limit. And we can take some of our other key species, red oak, yellow birch, sugar maple, and see that, um, you know, for the most part, Nova Scotia is near the, the sort of colder, more northerly end of their of their geographic ranges. So if you watch that blue bar with triangles move as I add in uh, new climate change scenarios, you can see here as we get to this sort of um, business as usual scenario in 100 years, uh, well, geez, 80, 80 years now, um, we can see that, well, we're right in the gut, in the, sort of the sweet spot for red maple, but we're starting to get towards the more southerly current limits of some of our, our hardwood species. And in fact, some parts of the province um, could be too warm for yellow birch and sugar maple. And, you know, this is a simplification, of course, but it's uh, a way to illustrate it. Now we look at some of our, um, our softwood species, uh, you know, red spruce, black spruce, balsam fir, white pine, uh, and we can do the same thing. So our center bar has changed here with growing degree days. So you can see it's, um, it's a bit more zoomed in and uh, we're covering a different range going here all the way up to the Northern tree line in, in the territories to around, I don't know, let's say somewhere in the uh, Northeast United States. And we can see here check the time <clears throat> that, um, uh, our current climate uh, sort of covers that same range, but just looks a bit different in this slide. And when we, we plot our species, we see sort of where we're situated within their, their climatic range or the climate envelope, as it's sometimes called. And uh, a few things come to mind. One is that it, it's, it's an oversimplification to think uh, as, as we adapt our woodlands to climate and start to think about, you know, stand tending and favoring species or even tree planting and, and species selection um, to that, that hardwood is good and softwood is bad when it comes to climate change. And this is a species specific thing and it's far more complex than, than species specific things uh, as well, as we'll see later. It, it matters at the ecosystem level and it also matters at the level of, of genes and genetic uh, suitability to, to given climates. But what we do see here is that white pine is actually, you know, it's a it's a warmer species, uh, a warmer climate species, whereas what we know, and I think this is probably becoming a bit um, uh, ingrained into our, our forest psyche in this province, is that um, black spruce and balsam fir, well, you know, these are more boreal species, and we're right near their southern limit. And as we bring in climate change, even our, even our, our less severe climate change scenario, um, our province uh, climatically becomes less suited to these species. And uh, as we get to the severe climate change, well, we're outside the range of um, uh, th those boreal, uh, colder climate species, and even the key species of red spruce, um, you know, where there are part, many parts in the province where climatically would no longer be within its historical climatic envelope. So a lot of things come to mind here. Uh, the first is that, you know, in reacting to these kinds of, of, of studies and even these kinds of uh, goofy PowerPoint infographics, you know, the question always becomes, well, what species do we plant? Well, if, if you speak to the research community and you look at people looking at this from the scale of ecosystems to species to, to, to genotypes, which is just the individual genetic profile of a, of, of a tree, um, well, the, the, the research community around um, adaptation and specifically assisted migration, where you're trying to keep up with that climbing, uh, the climate change, probably we're not nowhere close to uh, the point of, of moving, uh, introducing new species that don't sort of exist within this current range with regards to adapting our forests. Um, you know, so uh, next time you're at the, the nursery and you see the palm trees and the eucalypts, you can keep your wallet closed for now, um, both because of um, the the severity of climate change to date, but also because of the more importantly the level of uncertainty around how the climate's going to change and how what how does a species uh, react in an ecosystem that's that's changed all of a sudden it doesn't have those same constraints there's new neighbors right um, so um, a key thing now to adapt our woodlands and and you know we're talking in the next few decades is is a really good understanding of our, our current 
um, species uh, climate envelopes like I've just shown you and, and the biogeography of these existing species. And, and granted, I think uh, uh, me in particular and our department has some work there to make that uh, to, to pull this kind of info together and make it more available, which we're working on now, actually, um, to woodlot owners. Um, but to get that understanding um, so that um, we know in our specific geographic context, where are we more vulnerable? Where are we in the province in terms of where the climate's changing? What species do we have? And in particular, um, you know, um, what is the local management context and your, your philosophy and values for managing your woodlot? You know, if you're following more lines of the, um, the subcultural guide for the ecological matrix, for example, and, and applying some of those principles you know, of ecological forestry on your woodlot, well, there wouldn't be a lot of tree, tree planting. So it'd be more around tending around species that might be more climatically suited. And that kind of stand tending has also been one of the listed adaptations for dealing with drier conditions, you know, reduce, reducing density and also potentially, depending on the forest, um, increasing uh, carbon sequestration, which is always a good thing too. Um, but there's also the dealing with the fact that, uh, you know, in, in knowing these, the current climates, the, the severity of climate change, but also the local uh, context of, of where your woodlands are, is that climate change isn't going to erase uh, site conditions, you know, our, our soil nutrient and, and drainage profiles and, and topography and these kinds of things. So, you know, as the climate becomes quite severe, you know, let's say you're at the year 2070 and uh, your woodlot is, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of low poor nutrient um, uh, black spruce uh, uh, a patch of forest. Well, probably it's not going to work as an adaptation strategy to go in there and plant pure sugar maple, uh, for example. And and so this is when we get into the issues of, of seeing um, reduced potential forest productivity, but also needing to to tackle this from more than just a um, a species level question and getting into the genetics, but also into the ecology. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the northern limit of, of tree species ranges is, is typically constrained by climate. But when we get to the southern limit uh, uh, for some of these tree species, like, you know, like balsam fir and black spruce are going to find themselves. And a lot of the province is in sort of um, what, what was typically called in our FEC guide, edaphic or or sort of site constrained growing conditions, you know, dominated by, by black spruce and pine, for example. Well, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to look at when these species are, are outside of that climate envelope, they're not just going to disappear. Uh, how are they going to react? That's going to take research and monitoring. And it may be that we need to look at um, uh, genetics uh, and, and looking at ranges within um, uh, the current climate envelope of, of uh, a species, let's say red spruce, for example, and we're, we're not going to um, uh, take a whole new species to swap for red spruce, but we're going to look at um, the genotypes of where it's growing in the southern limits of that range and try and translocate it into, into the Nova Scotia climate, for example, um, where it may be more suited genet genetically to, uh, to the climate of the future. And this kind of research is, has been a really important uh, staple within the assisted migration and, and adaptation in forest uh, forestry world. Um, and uh, it's called provenance trials, and there's there's ongoing work on that right now in Nova Scotia. And in fact, it um, this kind of climate change research feeds in nicely to uh, tree improvement programs, and we've had one in place in, in uh, Nova Scotia for I, I believe several decades, and it's now called Atlantic. Is a little play on words, which is the Atlantic Tree Improvement Council with other with other provinces, <clears throat> and you know of of course historically. Uh, the, the focus has been on uh, improvement gains in, in productivity of, of, of key commercial species, but more and more of these programs are able to incorporate the climate change question and look at these provenance trials to see about not just improving growth, but maintaining, you know, a species uh, as, as the climate change uh, shifts. And uh, the department, along with many others across the country, uh, universities, government departments, industry, uh, and um, uh, Indigenous First Nations, um, have just joined a new uh, research project uh, called Silva 21, which is tackling these kinds of questions. You know, um, how do we do silviculture in, in, in a changing climate that in integrates the, the new social values that we do have? And there's even new emerging areas of research, which I have as a question mark there because I know absolutely nothing about it. So don't ask me about it in the question period. But uh, epigenetics, which is looking at well, not just um, tree breeding programs and, and provenance trials, which is bringing in new uh, genotypes, but the study of new um, 
expressions of genes uh, under stress, like climate change, that are already there without even changing the genetic makeup of a tree. So maybe all of a sudden, um, black spruce or balsa fir says, you know what, it's it's a little warm here. I'm going to fire up this gene. Just keep me going for a little bit longer if I can. Uh, and th that's some of the kinds of research that, that uh, that's been happening within that world, but um, outside of my purview as as more of an ecosystem modeler. But in terms of adapting woodlands, you know, we can't all be expected to start conducting our own genetic research across the province for our woodlots. Um, but if you can, I say go for it. But uh, I think really here, the key piece for adaptation uh, before, you know, above anything that actually happens in the woods is is information sharing and participating in, in networks, whether it be your woodlot owner group or whether it be, you know, attending these kinds of conferences like the Woodlands Conference or engaging with, with other uh, groups that do this kind of thing regionally. Um, so staying apprised of the research uh, and, and keeping your finger on the pulse there and, and building that community is, is just a real cornerstone of, of adaptation within forestry. And natural disturbance regimes, that's a key one too. And I, I've been thinking a lot about it uh, since I, I recently became the, the project uh, lead for the natural disturbance regimes team uh, that for implementing uh, the Leahy recommendations. And and the key uh, two key pieces there are that uh, one, um, emulating natural disturbances in, in our silvicultural practices is, is the, a staple of ecological forestry. And two, well, our, our natural disturbance regimes are changing uh, as the climate changes, and we're already seeing that um, on the ground across the country. And you know, just punch into uh, um, any news website, and you'll you'll find something along those lines pretty quick. So, part of um, the the need here was to first establish the baseline conditions of what are our disturbance regimes in Nova Scotia. If we want to emulate them, we got to really know them. And that sounds like a simplification or like maybe a ridiculous oversight that happened <laughs> at some point. But the, the, these kinds of data are, are quite sparse and, and uh, it's, it's, it's tricky to profile this in, in any kind of robust way that you can, you can build a program on in terms of having that hard data and that mapped data. So um, before I joined the game, um, the, uh, the NDR team conducted a great um, study, which is now published uh, uh, right here, you can see the the title and open access freely available <clears throat> led by Anthony Taylor from the Canadian Forest Service does that very thing and, and profiles uh, um, our existing disturbance regimes. Uh, we're in the process now of doing a second study, which involves mapping uh, these regimes to across the province so that they can answer the kinds of questions that we have in terms of ecological forestry, but also also climate change uh, vulnerability. Um, so, uh, that's, that's kind of the starting point. Um, but we, the, the issue is that, you know, like I mentioned, these regimes are changing, uh, and, uh, spoiler alert, the, the changing trend is more frequent and more severe, uh, natural disturbances, you know, hurricanes, for example, um, probably, um, we all, um, saw some, uh, you know, the woodland owners, uh, in the audience, uh, will have probably seen. At least one tree down and maybe some really um, devastating damage with with Dorian and before that hurricane one. Um, the research shows that, you know, we have our, our base annual disturbance rates for hurricanes now, but we, um, we know that there, with, there's more energy in the atmosphere because it's warmer. And so we, we don't expect to get necessarily more hurricanes, but we expect more severe uh, hurricanes in the future, which has huge implications for for our forest ecosystems and our woodlands. Um, <clears throat> and again, having that baseline condition helps us understand um, the, the spatial variability of of where we might be vulnerable to climate change. Um, so we know, for example, that with, with some of the, the the data and maps that I showed you earlier, with um, you know it's going to be wetter in Nova Scotia, but a lot of that that moisture is coming in the winter, and the, the, you may in fact have more um, more drier conditions um, in our in our growing season. And so uh, we did for this second study to, to get at that, you know, where is it like this and that uh, question, uh, we did some modeling around uh, wildfire in this province. And wildfire isn't a huge part of our disturbance regimes in Nova Scotia, but it is a part, uh, certainly, and it's notable. Um, and th the two reasons why it's not a major thing, uh, essentially today, uh, one is um, the climate and, and ecology and physiography of Nova Scotia. And two is we've just not, we, not Nova Scotia, not me, but just a society has become very effective at fire suppression. 
so to try and inform this vulnerability question, we uh, we modeled um, only lightning ignited fires across the province and had and, and, and modeled no fire suppression to see where burn probability might be happening. And then, you know, this is for the study now that we're just finishing up for the natural disturbance regimes uh, uh, work. But the next thing that we're going to move right into, or at least I will be under my role uh, as the climate change modeler, is well, let's combine that that we that what the data that we do have for climate change, and let's let's see where we're more vulnerable, and then obviously let's make that all available to uh, to to woodland owners in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> so looking at our our burn probability map um, in the absence of of uh, human caused fires and suppression and looking at the length of the fire season uh, as another indicator of climate change. Um, we can see that our current length of the fire season. So that's just whenever it's had no snow on the ground for, I think, three days and a minimum of, of 12 degrees at noon. Um, that's that's when the fire season starts. So it's longer than it might, you might think. Um, and, and if we implement changes to that under our severe climate change scenario, well, that fire season uh, can can change quite a bit um, from, you know, just three days in, in sort of down in the wet, uh, cooler Yarmouth way, but um, all the way up to 72 days up in the Cape Breton Highlands, um, where it's already vulnerable due to the uh, amount of balsam fir, but also the, the burn probability map that you see here. Um, and so these key things um, uh, are, are cumulatively going to be affecting woodlands on, on the landscape. <clears throat> and um, to, to add to that mix, you know, I wish there was just a recipe for climate change adaptation, but there's always these local context and sort of cumulative considerations on around the complexity of our forest disturbances. Um, so we know that in general, the trend is it's it's getting worse. You know, it's going to be crappier than it is today, but um, in uh, in in some instances, it won't be that simple. Uh, so spruce budworm, for example, there's a an outbreak happening right now. It's huge in Quebec. Uh, New Brunswick's uh, battling it at its doorstep with a new early intervention strategy, um, but it causes severe um, defoliation and mortality. But it's 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 more of a boreal disturbance agent. Um, you know, the species needs a certain amount of uh, cold temperatures in the winter for its life cycle, and it relies on a balsam fir, a more colder climate species, as, as its main host, although it'll get into the spruce, as we all know, too, during um, outbreaks. So we expect under climate change, generally, that um, this, these conditions would make it less likely for budworm, one of our main disturbance agents, uh, to be uh, favored in climate change. But there's there's these little complexities in the the short to medium term, you know, maybe for this outbreak that's happening uh, right now, if it hits us, um, maybe uh, for the next one, where sure it may be coming less favorable on average for spruce budworm, but for example, there, there's some research showing that the 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 timing of when these little guys wake up in the springtime, uh, the larval emergence, and and when they start feeding. And the timing of the the bud burst of its key host species um, uh, are are becoming more aligned. So in the meantime, they may uh, be getting to be much more efficient, uh, uh, hung, hungry little eaters, and getting fatter a lot quicker, and, and causing more damage. Wildfire could be another example where um, you know less of a major agent, but still one of our major disturbance agents. Um, we expect the general theme across the country, especially you know Western Canadian boreal forests, for example. Are, are more forest fires and more severe fires. <clears throat> so we expect that too in Nova Scotia uh, climatically, but if our if our forest composition is changing due to climate change as well, well, you know, maybe incre more increasing uh, broadleaf species uh, that are, you know, decreasing the amount of fuels for some of these more severe fires. So a lot of, lot of head scratchers there. And, and a key thing too is the question for ecological forestry. If we're basing our our management off of disturbance regimes. Um, if they change, does that move us away from our goal? And I, I don't know the answer. There's, it's not established in the in the scientific literature. What is established is that we need to be adaptable. We need to keep on monitoring and doing research. Um, there's a bit more on adaptation here too. I'm, I'm going to share some of this afterwards because I'm keeping an eye on the clock and I want to I want to get right into the carbon while we still have the time. Um, but there's there's more happening in, with regards to adaptation. Uh, abroad, but especially here in the province. But let, let's talk carbon uh, for a bit here too. I'll just wake myself up with some more coffee. Um, 
So when it comes to managing forest carbon, and, and probably a lot of you have, have heard me talk uh, on this um, before, or, or you've read it uh, online or seen it, um, uh, a video or heard it in the news, um, is because climate change is caused by increasing amounts of carbon and, and some other gases, but carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if we have ecosystems that remove that carbon and store it for long periods of time, um, they're, they're a, a, a tool in the tool basket for fighting uh, global climate change. And so when it comes to forests, really our end goal here is we wanna remove it from the atmosphere and we wanna do that for as much time as possible and, and maximize our ability to store it once it's out of the atmosphere. And, and I, I like it just keeping it as simple as that. And so let's let's think about that through and, and think about what you can do as managing uh, uh, your woodlands um, from the, through the lens of the triad, as I mentioned, because this is you know the new thing uh, in, in our province. So we'll start with the conservation leg of the triad. <clears throat> and in some ways, th th this relates to, of course, um, woodlands and, and obviously uh, to forests. But in terms of forests that are actively managed, um, you know, th this is more about conservation, about uh, land use at that broader level. So if something is not forested and it becomes forested, um, you know, that's a key thing there for conservation. Or more likely, if there's a threat of something becoming not forested anymore and it's protected, um, well, there's something on the conservation leg. And in terms of how do you go about that, if that's the approach that you're taking on your woodland, um, is, you know, how do you do that for from the point of view of, um, hitting that end game carbon objective? Well, it, it's fairly simple for the most part is, you know, kind of um, let the forest do its thing. You know, we look here, uh, Kejimikujik was uh, formed in, I think in the late 1960s. Um, well, the carbon story there is for the most part pretty good. Uh, and these carbon numbers are derived from our network of, of permanent sample plots. Um, there are considerations though, even for this, uh, not more simple leg of the triad, but the one where the carbon picture is more clear cut. Um, is uh, natural disturbances, for example, uh, those that are increasing uh, in frequency and severity, especially under climate change, um, they can kind of undo some of our good carbon work in this leg of the triad. Uh, if we look at our carbon from our plots in the Highlands uh, Park uh, up in Cape Breton, these are both the national parks. <clears throat> uh, we see that impact of the, uh, the 70s outbreak of spruce budworm. And a lot of those forests never really uh, recovered because of heavy moose browse from the introduced Cape Breton moose population. Um, but for the most part, we have our, our, our conservation leg of the triad approach to carbon kind of dialed in there. Uh, and then the other two legs of the triad where things get uh, much more difficult, but they're, they're two different approaches, obviously to managing a forest uh, and to, to looking at the carbon. Um, you know, it's no secret that the uh, high production forestry leg of the triad can be the one that sort of separates the room here. But uh, we did in, in the research leading up to that phase one uh, report, uh, uh, we, we did the carbon modeling for it because there was a long history of, of plantation trials um, to draw the, the, the data from and build carbon into that. And, and essentially what we, we see with our modeling here is that, you know, high production, one way to um, to, to, to go about managing your woodlands. If you're, if you're taking that approach on private, of course, it's private woodlands, it's, it's in your hands. Um, there's typically less carbon on the land base. Um, and and to, to be fair with these plantations, they are higher yields if they meet the prescriptions of, of high production forestries, often plantations don't. But under those things, the carbon storage at the time of the plantation uh, becomes mature is often quite a bit more than in um, sort of natural uh, stance. But of course, the key thing here, there's typically less on the land base over time because there's a shorter rotation. Um, and so that's a key thing too. Another key issue being um, uh, lower amounts of dead organic matter uh, as well, including soils. And that's something that we're, we're very concerned about and, and researching in lands and forestry. And if we have a soil scientist who's, who's looking at um, uh, the obviously the nutrient management regime for these soils and, and hopefully there can be amendments to, to help ameliorate any carbon issues in that soil, but that's an ongoing thing. But what you do have from here is is a higher yield obviously of, of forest products um, than in uh, the ecological matrix. And the, the thing here is that when you look at that end game of taking carbon out of the air and storing it for as long as possible, um, it, for the approach that we use in Canada for our international uh, reporting on, on carbon is that we include 
carbon in the woods and carbon in, in wood products. Um, so if there's a higher amount of longer lived products uh, and they're storing carbon for time, as you can see here in, in the green line over a few rotations, that can start to accumulate over time as well. So that is one pool that where there couldn't be some opportunities, especially where it's uh, offsetting higher emission alternatives than wood, uh, you know, for example, such as concrete um, uh, as, as an approach. So, you know, typically less carbon than would be on the land base over time. Um, but in our modeling, we, we've seen that it could still be um, a net sink of atmospheric carbon, which is, which is a good thing. Um, and then with the ecological matrix, we typically have uh, more carbon on, on the land base, especially in dead organic matter, because you have longer time of continuous cover and, and more mature forest uh, that, you're, that you're dealing with. Um, and if, if you're considering offsets, and we'll get to this, I promise, and I better uh, keep myself on my toes here, um, uh, it's more likely that any protocol that is developed down the line would probably, uh, uh, that's considering uh, carbon offsets that you can have access to and sell um, uh, to someone to an emitter uh, would uh, your your um, requirements that you have to do those all those offsets would probably be more aligned with this kind of management. Um, they often don't allow plantations, um, but I'll tell you in terms of what it matters to me is it's harder to model because these are much more complex um, uh, stand dynamics uh, from a carbon point of view than the, the more sort of traditional uh, even aged approach. So, you know, we're working on that. It's not as far along as the high production uh, carbon modeling because um, we're, we're having to develop, go back to the drawing board to develop new carbon yields. Um, but pretty soon we'll have the whole picture for the province under the, um, uh, the implementation of our new triad model. Because um, we, we know certain things, you know, we, we, we're very good at looking at our trees and knowing where the carbon is in that tree. And we're pretty good using tools um, that are peer reviewed uh, tools like the carbon budget model uh, that we use. Uh, we're pretty good at knowing uh, once that tree uh, is harvested, uh, what happens uh, to the wood. So if I take our 60 centimeter red spruce here and I knock it over and leave it on the bare ground with no soil, nothing there already, you know, this is, this is where the carbon's gonna go with that uh, increasing size pool on the top being the atmosphere, but of course some important amounts going to our forest floor and mineral soils. So we're, we're, we're scaling these up to start to look at um, the carbon change over time. And we know that we can get a good amount of carbon on our land base and really get storage up under the conditions where you are managing and you need, you're, you're getting for, for economic, social reasons or whatever else, you're, you're getting some wood off of the, that woodland. Um, we know that we can see um, carbon sequestration benefits uh, uh, over more traditional approaches that we've had in the past, just sort of um, natural stands, even age management, what have you, um, uh, we can get some pretty good carbon outcomes there. So what does the province look like? Um, well, again, using this tool, the carbon budget model uh, from the Canadian forest sector, <coughs> um, we, we can look at our different ecosystems and our different land conditions and look at how carbon changes in the dead stuff and the living stuff over time to start to paint a picture um, in some of the, the, the forecasting we do, for example, you know, um, uh, to look at things like wood supply and ecosystem change and, and what have you, um, but also to get um, uh, uh, paint a picture of current conditions and past conditions too. So, we know using our forest inventory data, um, that which informs the modeling, uh, sort of what our carbon landscape uh, looks like in this province. And this is based off of our um, photo interpreted forest inventory. So it's got complete coverage of the province, which is great, but there's some coarseness to it. And there's a lot of assumptions, just part of the process of photo interpretation uh, in forestry. Um, so often when we need to go back to the drawing board and you know do research and, and develop new things like our our new carbon uh, understanding for the ecological matrix, we go to our um, network of permanent sample plots. And you know, there's, there's over 3000 of them and many date back to the 60s. So it's a great resource for figuring out how carbon moves through the woods uh, so that we can apply it into new, new questions that we have like implementing the triad. Um, and if we look at how things have changed over time, uh, we can see that. Uh, we see that carbon uh, in the past four, in, PSP inventory cycles, they happen every five years, um, have started to show a, sm a small increase in the province. Uh, and we're getting to where we are now, which is around um, ballpark 250,000, uh, sorry, 250 million tons of carbon 
Um, we also recently started measuring some dead organic matter that that's more feasible to me to measure in the woods. Um, these past ones here uh, are are based on equations and model assumptions. Um, better than nothing, but not as good as field data. And we see that in the past cycle, we're, we're seeing a little bit of a decline in some of our dead organic matter. Um, and this this is research that's feeding into the state of the forest uh, report that's that's happening right now. And then we can get a picture as well uh, at the eco region level um, where we see. Um, you know, you can see some increasing, especially in the western uh, region. You see that dip in eco regions one and two, which is the spruce budworm, and you see everything uh, in between. Um, I, I always like to look at these kinds of questions from the point of view of uh, a standardized amount of carbon per hectare of forest, too, because that gives you a, a way to compare apples to apples. And and we can see here, you know, that less carbon uh, than than the rest, as you would expect in the Atlantic, uh, in in the coastal uh, uh, eco regions um, where those forests are highly exposed, and 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 then more so in, for example, our hardwoods uh, up in uh, eco region three. And as for carbon offsets, um, you know, so I just walk through three different approaches that you might consider managing uh, your woodlands, uh, your woodland carbon, uh, following the, uh, the essentially the philosophy of the triad. And you know, that's all well and good, and and I think there's a lot of insights there, especially when combining approaches, diversifying your your management, because um, that's a good way to ad to adapt to climate change too. Um, you know, no matter how much we mitigate. Uh, and, and fight climate change with reducing emissions and, and bolstering our forests. There will be some, and there has been some. So mitigation and, and uh, managing your forest carbon uh, goals can't happen in the absence of adaptation. So that's key point too. But uh, what the, the last point that I'll end on is, uh, you know, you might be asking yourself, yeah, it's all well and good to, uh, to manage my carbon, but, uh, you know, Who's going to pay me for that, right? And so, nothing, nothing stopping anyone from managing your forest carbon along certain values. And certainly, there's there's tools you can use to do so. And we're working on a few now, like some some modeling tools to help inform uh, you how to to sort of measure the carbon and forecast the carbon on your own woodlands. But in terms of a revenue stream uh, for that carbon, well, there's there's obviously a, a big area of focus has been around carbon uh, forest carbon offsets. So credits that you can get from managing your woods in a certain way and that you can sell to to emitters who want to reduce or have to reduce their emissions. Um, obviously, that sounds like a great thing and it has been a great thing for many uh, uh, example projects, um, but there's also uh, a lot of issues in terms of uh, accessing it as well. So what, what's our landscape here then? Um, in 2016, uh, the federal government uh, initiated carbon pricing in, in Canada and Nova Scotia. You know, there's, there's a few different ways that provinces and territories could go. Nova Scotia said, we're going to do a cap and trade market. So emitters um, are going to be capped at a certain amount and um, they have allowances that, that are actually auctioned for how much they're allowed to emit. If they emit less, boom, they can sell those allowances. If they emit to more, they got to buy them. Or in some cap and trade markets, if you emit uh, too much, you, you can you can trade and, and get those allowances to ex increase your cap, or you can purchase uh, carbon credits, so carbon offset credits from some kind of project that's outside of the cap and trade market um, that is removing carbon from the atmosphere. So you can go up to a forest landowner and say, "You keep more woods, keep more carbon on your woodlot, and I'll give you um, 20 bucks a ton for that carbon," uh, and that that amount that the forest can can store there. Um, would be taken off of their emissions um, to sort of make it economically easier for them to reduce their emissions in a cap and trade market. We've got one. It started in 2019. Um, there are no uh, offsets in our market yet, uh, which probably a lot you'd all be aware of, but not necessarily because these things change so so often. Um, so so why not? Uh, and where are they? Well, uh, Nova Scotia Environment uh, that oversees uh, the cap and uh, trade program and, and a lot of the climate change work in this province um, uh, are tackling this very question. And they hired a, uh, a consultant firm to do a large study on the feasibility of a few different kinds of carbon credits, uh, as offset protocols that could happen in our cap and trade, including forestry. And, and there could be, uh, I think there are people in this uh, room that would have been consulted for that. Um, but there's still from that work, no, you know, there, there's, there's, there's potential there, but there's no offsets in place. And, and there's a few reasons for that. 
One is just the amount of administrative work that has to go into creating these protocols. They're incredibly technical. Um, uh, you know, so one one uh, like so where else can we look in the meantime? Essentially, if you're a woodland owner and you want to sell your carbon, um, one one idea was to look at other jurisdictions. So you know, cap and trades are within what what's called a um, a compliance market where um, you're, you're selling uh, your carbon offsets to people that have to buy them under regulations, but but there's also voluntary markets and there's nothing stopping anyone from accessing the voluntary carbon markets any day, except for the very difficult access. And, and there's a lot of um, tremendous amount of costs to, to, to initiate that of all the, the work in terms of the measuring and the validation and this stuff that has to happen. And so it's, as a single woodlot owner essentially probably couldn't do that at all. Um, groups of woodlot owners potentially can, and there's been an example of this in New Brunswick under uh, an aggregation of different owners, uh, which can happen. And that, that's one approach in this voluntary market. Um, but the real reason why Nova Scotia, uh, or one of the main reasons uh, why Nova Scotia is waiting to implement any uh, forest carbon offsets here locally is that um, the federal government has announced that they're going to be doing the same thing under their federal greenhouse gas offset system. So they're saying, and I quote, uh, they want to encourage ways for GHG emissions to happen uh, and be cost effective for the emitters that, that are regulated now um, in areas that, that aren't covered by their carbon pollution pricing. That improves, that includes improved uh, forest management. That's one of the things that they've earmarked that they're studying uh, as one of the potential offset credits. And, and they've said that all provinces and territories, including us here in Nova Scotia would be eligible and they're at the stage now of you know doing consultation and looking to develop these protocols. So I think that's something that'll be the next thing that that we look towards uh, along this file. And I wanted to give a bit more time for questions on this and for everything because uh, I really like uh, that that um, engagement time that we can have. Uh, looks like I went a little bit longer than I planned. We still got almost ten minutes, um, and I don't know what the uh, Don mentioned around the timing. Um, I'm here for a bit longer, uh, if, if, if need be, depending on what works for people, and of course, uh, follow-ups uh, as much as, as we need to have them after this. So thanks for that, and uh, I will defer it over uh, to questions. Excellent. Thanks very much, James. It's very interesting and very high quality, informative presentation. You packed a lot in, in a short time, so thank you thanks. for that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to pack in too much. I apologize for that. <laughs> No, no, this is the introduction to this for a lot of people, so it's good. And uh, they know where to go with other questions, and, and, and that'll keep them coming back to you for other presentations. But uh, you have a polling question for them, I understand. That's right. Yeah, to, to get things going, I was wondering if we could uh, pull the audience. And, and I'd meant to do this uh, at, at one of the Woodlot Owner of the Year events where I was going to have a table, but um, it was either because uh, we had a, a new baby or COVID. I can't remember which one stopped me from going, but I didn't. But I would love to see sort of where your where your thinking is of what what keeps you up at night or doesn't uh, with regards to your woodlands and climate change. Excellent. So we're going to give everybody two or three minutes to answer that polling question, and also um, give them a chance to do to submit a question as well. We have a number of questions uh, set up here already, James. So while people right. are thinking about the poll, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, and there's some really good ones. Uh, first one, right. what is one practice small woodland owners can do to increase carbon sequestration? Well, there, there, there's so many different things. It's almost so hard to start to start to answer that. Um, I think the first thing would be to understand um, wh where your your conditions are. You know, what kind of ecosystems do you have here? And and even following um, the uh, silvicultural key, for example, like our new uh, silvicultural guide for the ecological matrix. And uh, there's even one that uh, the New Brunswick Woodlot Group started. It's a an added adaptive silvicultural guide for for climate change and carbon. Um, and it's a key as well. So that'll ask you the kinds of questions based on your local conditions. You know, maybe you, all you need to do is do nothing. And your 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 forest type and your current uh, age structure is at a point where you you let it grow, and it's a growing forest is sequestering carbon, right? Maybe you're at a point where you're going to want to go in there and do some tending and and um, uh, some competitive re release to release uh, to increase carbon sequestration rates, or it could be uh, you're at a point where, um, you know your 
from just wherever has happened in the past. Uh, you know, we've got a long history of forest management in this province, um, longer than mo most other parts of the country. Maybe, um, maybe some ecosystem restoration is needed. So maybe you're you're stuck in a sort of earlier or mid succession state, or even mm -hmm. conditions that don't typify um, your 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 soil and your your climate, where you need to intervene and then try and restore it to long-lived uh, Acadian species that store the most carbon and also start to feed carbon into uh, that dead organic matter in that soil. So Yeah, that, that makes me think about the balsam fir white spruce stands that people are sitting on out there, that they want to uh, increase the carbon, but they know that the lifespan is is approaching the, the end of their and you might, lives. It, often it's a long game, right? You know, increasing mm -hmm. you, the, your carbon uh, capacity in your woodlands might mean um, being a, a net source of carbon for a little bit to try and ameliorate some current conditions. Long term, isn't it? Okay. Well, thank yeah. you for thank you to Dave. That was a question from out of the country that uh, that you just answered. Uh, next question: Great. As as far as risk of wildfire goes, climate change I think is a factor. But what about years of wildfire suppression? Is this seen as being a huge driver in making wildfire more prevalent in the disturbance regime of the Acadia forest region? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so. Without question, fire suppression, if you, you can look at the data, and I recommend folks to, to download that that first uh, disturbance regime study um, led by Anthony Taylor, um, you see the effect of fire suppression quite clearly in the data. So that um, has implications for um, the, and, and I'm not a fire modeler by heart, I've just, I, I just dip my toe in for some of this research, but uh, we know that there's more accumulation of fuel then. So with, with a strong suppression regime, when, when there is a fire, especially when those conditions for fires are being made more likely with climate change um, and it mm -hmm. escapes suppression, it, it can be more severe. Uh, that's one thing we know. Um, but also, you know, outside of climate change, uh, fire suppression can change, uh, you know, the, the ecology uh, as well in terms of um, uh, the ecosystem structure, but um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a risk for sure. Um, I, I think less of a risk again in in uh, the Acadian forest region, but but still one. Mm -hmm. And you hear about it in the BC situation quite often. It uses an example. That's right. The buildup. Yeah. Okay. Question regarding the value of young regen yeah, as far as carbon goes. What about regen sites with various species and ages, although they're young for carbon offsets as it grows, and it will also act as a climate change adaptation where various species are promoted over time? Can you read that one more time, Don? Sure. What about regen sites with various species and ages, although young, mm -hmm. for carbon offsets as it grows and also climate change adaptation where various species are promoted? So I think they're getting at what about the young yeah. regeneration? Yeah. And also, um, I, I love that that question touched on such something, that something near to dear to me is that um, the linking up of adaptation and mitigation. So the linking up of dealing with climate change while also fighting it. And that's great. So we might assume just simply that um, uh, as that forest grows in the changing climate condition, if you if you enhance species diversity, uh, uh, that's one big tool for adapting a forest to climate change. Just from the simplest point of view, uh, it's more likely that some of those species, if there's more of them, are going to be suited to the future climate. But also that can be sort of thought through in terms of uh, the any particular species. <clears throat> so over 100 years, if you've adapted this site, which is at the regeneration stage, um, to potentially future climate based on the diversity mix of species or the species mix that you have in particular, um, it'll do a better job at growing and storing and sequestering carbon in a changed climate, for sure. Um, but, you know, when, when we're dealing with... Um, Regen sites, if you look at um, uh, the carbon dynamics of a young forest that, um, especially with, you know, uh, um, a harvest or or a sort of stand replacing natural disturbance, um, those trees start to go and sequester carbon in the morning, you know, this, as soon as they shoot out of the ground and, and start um, start growing. But there's usually a, a big pulse of of um, of dead stuff after a disturbance or a harvest, you know. So you, you, we might we might call it slash, or you know, you might call it coarse woody material. You might call it whatever else. But there's a big pile of it usually from from whatever has, has caused the, uh, mm -hmm. the disturbance, anthropogenic or, or natural, and that decomposition outweighs the sequestration um, for you know the first few decades. So it takes a little bit for a forest to become uh, the um, the sink that it can be for that sort of scale to tip. Great. And Thanks in terms that. of that linking to offsets, um, 
less so uh, let fewer links to offsets there in terms of like, uh, cause you have to be able to prove it, right? So mm -hmm. can you prove to me that you're more adapted to climate change? Well, if I'm in the business of validating offset credits, you know, uh, as a third party sort of valuator, I might say, well, where's the certainty in, in how much the climate's going to change in these kinds of things. So it's more about the silvicultural regime than it is about uh, any kind of adaptation to climate change on, from the offset point of view so that it can be measurable and provable and all these kinds of things. Right. Measurable. Yes. Um, and speaking of measurable, we as human beings and certainly woodland owners like to have practical guides that we can go by. So this question is yeah. related to that. Can you please summarize the practicalities of managing a forest? for maximum carbon capture, i.e., should we favor big trees, little trees, certain species, multi-age, or what? There, yeah, that's that's a tough one. In terms <laughs> yeah. of, um, it, it'll depend on uh, your ecosystem. I mean, oftentimes, if you're looking at the whole um, spread of, of the living forest carbon, dead organic matter, and, and, and soils, which you know include dead organic matter carbon, um, uh, hardwood is usually a good thing on the dead organic matter stuff, especially the soil stuff, because that high turnover of, of foliage. So we see that when we add in all the carbon, if we look at our, you know, I can, maybe I can flip back uh, my slides here. If we look at our, our carbon yields, um, in general, when everything's included, uh, you're going to have more in hardwood uh, and then uh, than you would in, in a softwood. And, and mainly not necessarily because of the living carbon. Um, often there's going to be more in, in softwood because there'll be more growth, but in, in the dead organic matter. So that's one approach. Um, you know, there's there's the um, the some studies have shown as well that, you know, multiple cohorts, you know, you've got more leaf area um, uh, sequestering carbon and more storing it. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, on, on the uh, the younger forest side and the sort of more high production model, um, the key there is is asking what you're doing with your products. And and so, you know, this is the reason why it's the, the high production is part of the triad. You know, for for economic and, and sort of uh, reasons, um, is there's a, a more of a yield of product, so that you got less carbon on the land base. But if that decrease in carbon on the land base can be somehow compensated for a bigger mix of longer lived products, um, that, that's another approach too. But, you know, if to really do that question, I would want to sit down with, with a, a strong coffee and my computer <laughs> next to the, to the person who asked the question and say, let's, let's look at your woodlot and what, what kind of conditions you have. So are you, um, right. you know, what, what eco section might you be finding in what, what's possible and once. Once we have a bit more detail, then we can look at an array of options and pick the one that's, that removes the most carbon over time. Now, speaking of markets, and I know this is a difficult one for you, but it's it's a concern that many of us landowners would have as far as market, you know, for carbon in the future. What happens to Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia woodland owners and its carbon system if most of the carbon offsets are already sold offshore? Uh, well, it's it's a competitive market, you know, and so uh, if 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 there if that market's getting flooded, um, that's an issue. Now, um, with the with the voluntary markets, you know, there's that's that's big competition. So you've got to you've got to stand out, and mm. you've already got to have someone working for you to to um, to sort of find those opportunities. I I don't know that much about them, uh, but I know that that's an issue. It's just finding the buyer, right? Um, but for the compliance markets. There's often a um, bit more bit more action there because it's not it's a controlled market condition because it's it's controlled by by law and policy and regulations. So um, pe they, people have to buy them. <laughs> and so <laughs> if there are additional policy constraints, like for example, um, if the federal government is saying we want to uh, uh, favor um, offsets in our new federal program from provinces that don't already have an offset market. Um, well, that would maybe put Nova Scotia ahead of Quebec or Alberta or something like that. Um, right, right. So, okay, so competitive. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a two-pronged thing. Uh, and it's, mm -hmm. again, it's that difference between uh, the voluntary market and the compliance markets. But um, in my, you know, I, I don't have a long background in, in forest carbon offsets and the economics of it and all these kinds of things. But I've been doing a lot of learning on the fly just by the nature of my job. But the the sense that I sort of get is that carbon credit opportunities aren't aren't 
growing on trees if you forget the pun or they're, they're, they're yeah. not raining in opportunities they it, it takes a lot of work to get them going and when you do get them going they're great like you know we've heard of that example in new brunswick uh through climate force international we've heard of that example in i believe maine i've, I've seen this guy present um his name and the name of his group um but there's been some great ones so when it can happen it's great it just takes a lot of input for that output okay we'll go with a few more minutes uh if, are you okay james times time yeah, yeah for sure yeah okay so here's a question from don um are we creating conditions that are changing climate and thus threatening species in our Acadian forest for example are we contributing to moisture deficiencies affecting forest regeneration and productivity in a negative way are we creating conditions that are, um, yeah, in, in some ways, yeah. Um, you know, so if, if we're managing um, uh, forests where um, we're, we're, we're favoring uh, some species that may not be climatically suited in the future, um, that would be a potential issue. Um, but uh, it, on, in terms of uh, the moisture, you know, in, when you have you have less moisture um, and sort of hum humidity and in the, in the air and also in, in the soil under open conditions than closed ones so you can have um, you know for example faster uh, decomposition and, and and less storage in, in the dead organic matter um, but how you how you manage the the forest is going to be a huge influence in, in, in future you know I'm thinking of terms of implementing um, uh, the triad and ecological forestry um, in, in terms of the regeneration that we'll get. So if we're, if we're favoring sort of higher, higher shade, closed canopy uh, conditions, we're going to get more regeneration of those longer lived, um, uh, those lit species, the latent intermediate tolerant species. Um, but at the same time, you know, that could be implications of losing some of our habitat of our early successional stuff that may be in areas that there are parts of the problems we know from our research that have had and do have more frequent and severe uh, natural disturbance regimes where not all by any means, but some of that landscape based on the the uh, the return interval of those disturbances is going to be found in those early successional species that, that may not be as suited uh, to climate change, for example, but um, uh, our local ecosystem conditions are suited to them. So that mm -hmm. that gets to a point, you know, where adapting to climate change and maximizing carbon um, is not all just good news all the time. If you can do it, it's great. But there are there can be trade offs too in terms of for local um, biodiversity conditions or obviously mm -hmm. economic conditions as well. Yeah, these are good questions. Yes. Well, our last uh, formal question of the night goes okay. uh, or comes from a gentleman who's got a genuine interest in this because he plants these species for the long term for uh, environmental purposes. Okay. Nice. So Jonathan asks. First, he says, great stuff, James. Any quick thoughts on the potential fate of conifers, such as eastern hemlock, eastern white cedar, and eastern larch? Those will probably all be heavily stressed as temperatures rise, similar to black spruce. He has in question mark. Um, I would say, and again, going back to that, um, uh, that range of um, uh, uh, different climatic envelopes of our conifer species. So eastern hemlock of our conifers it has a narrower range than something like white pine, but it's doesn't fare as bad. It's more of a temperate conifer species um, than than uh, something like black spruce or balsam fir. So uh, I, I don't see it doing as bad. I, I you know it's funny. I had um, an eastern hemlock map and its and its climate envelope in front of me as I was putting these slides together and. Um, I opted for which one? I opted for white pine just because it showed that broader southern range, and there was more of it on the map than there was eastern hemlock. Hemlock being a key uh, Acadian late successional species, but there's less of it <laughs> than white pine, so I should have included it. But um, when we think about others like uh, like larch and tamarack um, in particular, um, it's again a colder climate species. So here's the thing with that, though, you know, it's it's a colder climate species so we we know that to some degree it will be stressed uh, and potentially maladapted to future climates but if we think about where it grows you know balsam fir grows like a carpet underneath most forest types in nova scotia right but uh mm -hmm. Your tamarack, you're going to find it mostly in, in your poor drained uh, even sort of open uh, woodland conditions in, in wetlands and so we we don't ex I wouldn't expect uh, to see a lot of influx of some of our lit species, some of our tolerant hardwoods into those conditions, of course. But uh, what you might expect to see is that those will th that these trees will be able to persist 
beyond that climate envelope that they have, you know, um, it, they'll just be under stress. And so that would result in, you know, maybe more mortality, maybe slower growth rates and what have you. But uh, that, that would be what I would suspect. Okay, thanks. Because we know that landowners love this segment of our, our sessions with qu questions and answers because it gets down to some of the practical things they wonder about. They're, they're, I'm going to yeah. squeeze in one more question because it's sort of sure, the crux please. of the crux of of what we often think of in terms of climate change impacts, and it's a very simple one. Will we see more southern fauna and flora moving north with climate change over time? Well, uh, there's two that I have seen, and I wish I hadn't already in the province. <laughs> I'm thinking of the hemlock really adulged, and I'm right. thinking of uh, ticks. Um, but, yes. you know, I, I won't, yeah, I, I'm more of a jack of all trade researcher than, than many, but I, my area of expertise and my research background isn't in the wildlife side of things. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I believe, based on what I've read, I believe the answer is yes. And that's, you know, a bit of a problem with, for example, habitat connectivity in protected areas where, mm -hmm. um, the, the protected areas are kind of now like roving windows if, if the species are moving that they're trying to conserve and the connectivity is so critical because there is uh, this migration, uh, this climatic migration of species. But I don't know nearly enough about that. And uh, we do have someone who's actually undertaking a PhD in our, our wildlife division who's who's asking these kinds of questions. So um, maybe he'll he'll give a talk soon and we can we can put it to him. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, James. So I'm going to I'm going to finish this up with a with a comment. Uh, and it but, is, uh, Don, before, yes. oh, yeah, yeah, before yeah, I hand just, it over I, to you, let me, yes. yeah, go you ahead. go ahead, but I was just going to say, I want to see, I'm just going to tell folks uh, who won in the poll here. Yes, you go ahead then. Okay. Uh, so uh, in, on these concerns, and this is really helpful for me and especially the department, you know, uh, as we move forward and thinking about the kind of programming and tools we need to make available. But I see here that uh, in the lead by far is all of the above, <laughs> as you would expect. Um, and then a lot of no answers, uh, which is of course fair. And then um, the, the number two, um, by a long shot, is, is more severe weather and storms like hurricanes. So really yeah. good to know. Excellent. Thanks, James. Just to uh, summarize the, the last comment that came in was very informative. There's a lot I didn't know. I will be passing this link around to others who I know will be interested. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so James. Much. Thank you very much for this presentation. Very interesting. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking your time and effort to be here uh, this evening to do this. And uh, because of the fact that we're only getting together virtually this year, we're unable to present you with a thank you gift on behalf of all those here that benefited from your experience and your words this evening. However, James will soon be receiving a container of the most popular non-timber forest product there is in our favorite sweet treat of the season, maple syrup from Rosebriar Farm of Carol's Corner. So we'll get that to you soon, James. Looking forward to it. Right on. Thanks. So, My folks, pleasure. It was great to be here. Thank you again. Folks, that's the, the end of tonight's agenda. Uh, again, we'd like to thank our presenter, James, for making this event possible and meaningful to all of those of us who tuned in tonight. And congratulations to those 100 plus people who did tune in on this beautiful Wednesday evening. So way to go. I'd like to remind everyone that this, this is the fourth in the series of six spring mini series presentations that will be running every two weeks. The next session will be April 7th, two weeks from tonight. The two topics on that evening will be cohabitation of you and wildlife in your woodlot by DL, Department of Lands and Forestry Wildlife Biologist Sarah Spencer. And the second presentation will be biodiversity pilot project by biologist Abby Lewis of the Mersey to Tobiatic Research Institute. The full conference mini-series schedule can be found again at the NS Woods website. We plan to hold additional webinar sessions in October and November once the busy spring and summer season is over. Grand prize, what you've been waiting for. Our Woodland Conferences are well known for our grand prizes that we give away each year and that is chainsaws. Well, this COVID year is no different. We'll be holding two draws for chainsaws at the end of the conference mini-series. All of you that participate in these events will be eligible. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, for every session you take part in, you'll have a ballot with your name that will go into the barrel for those two lucky draws. So the more events you take in, the better your chances of winning one of these new steel pro-grade chainsaws. Finally, Please provide your feedback in the exit survey. This will help us plan for future conference events. That's what we've done in the past and we will continue to do. We'll listen to you and, and provide what you want to hear. 
To do this, before you close down your browser, click on Leave Event to get to the exit survey, which only takes one or two minutes to complete, and your information, we promise, will be kept private and not used for any promotional commercial purposes. And if for some reason you're not able to do that, you can get this information by going to the NS Woods website and just letting us know that you were unable to get the survey and we'll get it to you. All right, that's it for now, everyone. Uh, we hope that this was a worthwhile use of your time and that you learned plenty. We look forward to our next session in two weeks. We hope to connect with you then. Thanks and take care of each other. Good night.